Good morning. My name is Dr. Subramanian, one of the visiting associate professors of Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. I'm going to um, talk about advanced topics in anesthesiology, and my topic is pertinent to cardiovascular system and advanced cardiac anesthesia. Cardiac anesthesia is not complete without uh, talking about uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Cardiopulmonary bypass, the concept started in 1813, and the first use of cardiopulmonary bypass was in 1953. Um, during the year, it was used for a closer of uh, atrial septal defect by Gibbon. And gradually, the disposable bubble oxygenator and biomedicus centrifugal pumps all were introduced into practice. Nowadays, the state of art cardiopulmonary bypass machines are used in most of the hospitals for cardiac operations. And we are going to describe the key components of cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, if you describe cardiopulmonary bypass by definition, uh, it is as extracorporeal mechanical circulatory support that diverts blood away from the heart and pulmonary circulation. It provides systemic perfusion and gas exchange, facilitates surgery on heart, thoracic aorta, and lungs. A highly trained perfusionist is responsible for conduct of cardiopulmonary bypass, but the communication between surgeon perfusionist and anesthesiologist throughout the cardiopulmonary bypass is key to successful cardiac operation. If you look at the basic uh, CPB circuit uh, from the patient, all the venous blood from right atrium and right ventricle on right side of the heart and the veins are diverted to a venous reservoir. From the re venous reservoir, the blood is pumped into the heat exchanger and membrane oxygenator, and the blood gets oxygenated here and enters the arterial line put back into the patient. So it completely bypasses heart and lungs so that you can perform operations on hearts and lungs. Uh, venous reservoir is a key component and the first component in the uh, CPB circuit. It's usually drained, the venous drainage is by gravity, siphon effect. Um, vacuum can be used to assist drainage. The basic function of the reservoir is it holds extra blood volume than that is needed for the pump flow. Um, <clears throat> the second component of the CPB circuit, as you see, is the blood pump. There are two types of blood pumps. One is a roller pump and another is centrifugal pump. Um, most of these pumps produce, provide non-pulsatile flow and driving force to propel blood throughout the system of cardiopulmonary bypass. If you look at the roller pump, it has an inlet and it has an outlet and it has a tubing and it has a rotating roller, it, which is the main component which diverts, propels blood, and there is a back plug. So <clears throat> if this roller rotates, it pushes the tubings against the back plate, which is the main driving force for propelling blood out into the outlet. <clears throat> So centrifugal pumps are also commonly used nowadays, which can be two types. Um, it's a cone type and a van type. Um, again, these pumps, the differences, essential differences between roller pump and centrifugal pumps are described in this table. Uh, if you say roller pump, compression of blood tubings against a back plate pushing the blood forward. But in case of centrifugal pump, if you go back, rapidly spinning components uh, like a cone or vein impart kinetic energy to blood, propelling it forward by vortex dis displacement. <clears throat> this is the rapidly spinning cone or vein which pro imparts kinetic energy. Um, in, it is the roller pumps are occlusive when stopped. If you stop the pump, it gets occluded automatically. But centrifugal pumps, it doesn't prevent backflow, so arterial line has to be clamped when it is stopped. The chances of embolism and the trauma to the RBCs and platelets are less with centrifugal pumps, and the centrifugal pumps are both preload and afterload dependent. 
Next component of the cardiopulmonary bypass, if you go back, is the heat exchanger and membrane oxygenator, which are together assembled in the circuit. If we <coughs> look at the characteristics of oxygenators, bubble oxygenators are history because of risk of microembolism and lack of independent control over oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal. Membrane oxygenators are used nowadays, which mimics alveolar membrane. Air oxygen mixture regulates the PaO2 and gas flow rate, which is the sleep rate, through the oxygenator regulates the PaCO2. <coughs> So this is the uh, picture of the membrane oxygenator. If you look at the heat exchanger and membrane oxygenator are assembled together, uh, heat exchanger has a water inlet and water outlet, the blood inlet and blood outlet. If you look at the oxygenator, there is a gas inlet and the gas outlet and the blood inlet here and the blood outlet. <coughs> So, if you dissect the membrane part, there is a hollow fiber membrane through which gases are passed through like oxygen and the blood flows in between that hollow fiber membranes um, and then get oxygenated. The oxygen diffuses through the membrane and reaches the blood and uh, the blood is carries the oxygen from the membrane and towards the arterial line. <coughs> So the heat exchangers are incorporated into membrane oxygenator proximally. There is a large reservoir to deliver heated or cold water through the heated exchanger in a counter current fashion. Blood and water are separated by stainless steel coils to maximize the surface area for heat transfer. So if you look at the heat exchanger and membrane oxygenator assembly, this is how it looks like. This is the heat exchanger, this is the membrane oxygenator, and the, <clears throat> there is stainless steel coils in the oxygenator, and the blood goes in, water goes in, depends on the temperature, it cools or uh, you know, uh, bombs the blood, and it enters the membrane oxygenator, gets oxygenated, and gets out into the arterial line. Now, after reaching the arterial line, it goes through a uh, filter, arterial filter, and this is the arterial filter is the last line of protection against gas or particulate embolization. Um, centrifugal effect, the here also centrifugal effect, what happens is the air or gas is carried up and the blood is carried to the bottom <coughs> by centrifugal effect. Um, the leukocyte depletion filters have been shown to um, reduce the inflammatory response to CPB and used in some centers. Um, to assemble together the CPB safety features um, are important because you do not want um, excessive air embolization. Um, you want to be safe in terms of volume in the pump. You also want to be safe in terms of temperature. Also, you want to avoid any uh, un, um, unexpected complications during CPB. So <clears throat> look at some of the safety features. There is a port for administration of fluids and blood products. In case the reservoir volume goes down, um, you can administer fluids and blood products into the venous reservoir. If there is venous reservoir overfills, you can vent some of the blood um, from the venous reservoir. There is a vent. Um, there is, you can incorporate an ultrafiltration device into the um, um, CPB machine. You can also monitor venous oxygen saturations, which is an estimate of global cardiopulmonary bypass function. Um, <clears throat> low volume sensors are available in the venous circuit and inline bubble detectors after the venous reservoir prevents air entrainment. There is also a port for venous gas and biochemical analysis. There is a venous line temperature monitor to avoid excessive, excessive heating of blood. <coughs> there is a port for arterial blood sampling. There is an arterial line temperature monitor, again avoid excessive uh, heating of blood. Arterial line pressure alarm, if there is excessive pressure building up in the arterial cir circulation because of resistance, it will give an alarm. Arterial line bubble detector and alarm. Arterial line in filter, that's the defense against air embolization. Inline arterial blood gas analyzer, which gives um, pH and other arterial blood gas. Um, throughout continuously. There is an oxygen analyzer in the gas supply line to avoid any mishaps in the gas pipeline. <laughs> 
So these are all some of the safety features of cardiopulmonary bypass. Now going to anticoagulation, which by itself is a safety feature because of exposure to the um, extrinsic component, blood can clot. To avoid clotting of blood, you give anticoagulation, which is heparin most of the time. The heparin combines with antithrombin-3 and prevents clotting by inhibiting thrombin and platelet factors like 10A, 9A, and 12A. <coughs> So activated clotting time, which is ACT, is used to monitor heparin anticoagulation during CPB. Normal and um, activated clotting time is 100 to 160 seconds. ACT required for CPB initiation is 400 and above. Uh, though the number varies between institutions, the blood sample should be drawn three minutes after heparin dose, which is usually 300 units per kilo for on-pump cases. Monitoring anticoagulation is by, uh, though it's traditionally done by activated clotting time, there are other assays like blood heparin assay are called HEPCON, high dose thrombin time which is useful in patients on heparin preoperatively. Heparin dose response curve can be used to titrate heparin and this is the dose response curve. You <clears throat> see the basal ACT give 300 units per kilo of um, heparin and then plot that ACT after 300 units per uh, kilo and draw a line between the baseline and the uh, therapeutic ACT. And uh, during CPB, for example, if the ACT drops from 500 to 400, then you calculate the difference between that doses and then administer the top-up dose to compensate for the ACT. <coughs> So that's how the heparin dose response curve is used during bypass, but also it can be used uh, after the end of the K bypass to reverse heparin by titrating protamin. Um, <clears throat> heparin resistance is another problem which can happen in elderly patients, thrombocytosis, hypereosinophilia, and there is a congenital antithrombin 3 deficiency, but the acquired AT3 deficiency is more common in patients receiving heparin uh, preoperatively, infective endocarditis, intracardiac thrombus, patients with uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation and shock. Um, some of the drug and uh, drug interactions also can cause heparin resistance like uh, oral contraceptives and IV nitroglycerin. So what do you do when you have heparin resistance? Um, the, it is typically defined as ACT less than 400 seconds after heparin 300 units per kilo. First check the intravenous line by aspirating blood. Make sure that you injected heparin into the vein or, or uh, into your vein. Um, uh, check the vial and syringe that you administered the right medication. Um, administer 100 units per kilo increments of heparin up to a maximum dose of 600 units per kilo. If ACT is still not therapeutic and less than 400 seconds, then you can use either antithrombin-3, 75 units per kilo, or fresh frozen plasma, one to two units. Uh, to correct that um, heparin resistance. AT3 is uh, more commonly used than fresh frozen plasma because of transfusion induced um, reactions in patients. People prefer to use antithrombin-3 vials nowadays. Uh, protamine, it's derived from salmon sperm which is used to neutralize heparin at the end of the bypass. Empiric dosing is one milligram for every 100 units of heparin given at the onset of CPB. Heparin dose response curve is commonly you not used, but it can be used to titrate protamine against heparin. Excessive protamine is not benign because it can cause platelet inhibition and coagulopathy. Venous cannula should be removed before beginning protamine and pump suction should be stopped after the protamine is uh, started. Protamine can cause um, severe reactions. Um, the commonest reaction is systemic hypotension, and it's also related to the speed of administration. 
Um, it can also cause severe pulmonary hypertensive crisis, which is related to heparin and protamine complex formation. If that happens, um, reinitiation of cardiopulmonary bypass may be necessary. Uh, true allergic phenomenon can happen in patients who take NPH insulin, fish allergy, vasectomized men, and previous protamine reactions. Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema is another uh, protamine reaction which can be early or delayed 20 minutes after uh, protamine administration. Blood products are also implicated in this non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It's not clear whether you, it's because of the blood products given or because of the protamine given. <coughs> Heparin rebound is another um, significant problem in patients uh, getting re-explored um, for bleeding. Re residual heparin bound to plasma proteins are released one to eight hours after protamine administration. Administration of fresh protein plasma or blood products enhancing AT3 levels is another factor. Heparinase ACT or heparinase thromboelastogram will clearly establish diagnosis. Um, if you um, do a plain ACT, it will be high. If you neutralize the heparin by, do, by heparinase ACT, that ACT will be normal in, in patients with um, heparin rebound. Same with thromboelastogram. The thromboelastogram will show a flat line with, without heparinase, but with heparinase, the thromboelastogram will be normal if it is because of heparin rebound. <clears throat> so additional protamine is the treatment for heparin rebound. Um, fibrinolysis is also another problem during cardiopulmonary bypass that is activated by tissue plasminogen activators from the endothelium. Plasminogen activates plasmin and uh, plasmin activates fibrin to fibrin degradation products um, which is the process called fibrinolysis and the fibrinolysis can also cause bleeding. So the prevention measure for uh, fibrinolysis is antifibrinolytics which they are routinely administered during cardiopulmonary bypass. Epsilon amino caproic acid or tranexamic acid are two medications uh, to inhibit plasminogen and they are used routinely in um, during bypass to prevent fibrinolysis from happening. So <clears throat> at our institution we use epsilon amino caproic acid 10 grams loading dose after heparinization uh, followed by 1 gram per hour till skin closure. Tranexamic acid and uh, epsilon amino caproic acid are both efficacious but uh, tranexamic acid is more expensive in United States so we use EACA. Avoid both lysine analogs, both of these drugs in patients with hypercoagulable disorders. Decrease the dose in patients with renal dysfunction. Both reduce the requirement for blood product transfusion and chest tube drainage after cardiac surgery compared to placebo. <clears throat> The pharmacodynamics of anesthetic drugs on cardiopulmonary bypass depends on various factors. First factor is dilution by priming solution. Um, the drugs gets diluted by the priming solution, decreasing its effective concentration and decreased effectiveness is seen. Some of the drugs bind to cardiopulmonary bypass circuit and that decreases their effectiveness. Uh, during rewarming phase, there is increased metabolism and increased requirement for the drugs. Uh, it's not uncommon to administer uh, midazolam or fentanyl while rewarming phase so that that increased requirement for drugs is covered. Uh, some of the factors increase the effectiveness of the drugs given during cardiopulmonary bypass. The first one will be acid-based challenges during cardiopulmonary bypass increases the plasma-free unbound fraction of the drugs. So that will increase the effective concentration and effectiveness of the drug. Um, there will be decreased liver and kidney blood flow during cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, that decreases the metabolism and elimination of the drugs which also leads to increased in effectiveness. Hypothermia also decreases uh, the requirement for the drugs, also decrease the metabolism. So there is an increase in effect in hypothermia. <coughs> Temperature management during bypass um, is important. 
Uh, systemic hypothermia is classified into mild, moderate, deep and profound. Mild hypothermia is defined between 32 and 35 degrees Celsius. Moderate is 26 to 20, 31 degrees Celsius. Deep hypothermia is 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. And anything less than 20 degrees Celsius is uh, profound hypothermia. Hypothermia decreases oxygen consumption, 5 to 7 percent decrease in oxygen consumption per degree Celsius. Temperature is, should be monitored at different sites during cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, tympanic membrane, nasopharynx, PA catheter, esophagus, bladder, rectum and arterial cannula inflow are uh, common sites to monitor uh, temperature during cardiopulmonary bypass. <clears throat> Hypothermia versus normothermic cardiopulmonary bypass. What are the advantages and disadvantages? If you have hypothermia, there is low flows, less blood cell damage, decreased metabolism, decreased anesthesia requirements, and hypothermia is organ protective. The disadvantage of hypothermia is coagulopathy and longer bypass time during cooling and rewarming. It takes time, so it leads to more coagulopathy. Rewarming should be done over 30 minutes, 2 degrees Celsius difference between CPB perfusate temperature and nasopharyngeal temperature rather than 4 degrees Celsius ensure slow rewarming. Equilibrium between the bladder and nasopharyngeal temperature at 30 degree, 36 degrees Celsius is, uh, should be required at the end of bypass. Uh, equilibrium decreases the after drop from perfusion of the cold blood from periphery to the center core after termination of cardiopulmonary bypass. Limiting 10 degree gradient between the blood and heating coils during rewarming prevents formation of gas bubbles from low solubility. These are all the some of the principal and safety features during rewarming phase. Hemodynamic during cardiopulmonary bypass, mean arterial blood pressure is pump flow rate multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. MAP targets are 50 to 80 millimeter mercury. Flow rates required to achieve that MAP target is usually 50 to 70 ml per kilo per minute. Low mean arterial pressure during cardiopulmonary bypass is related to low systemic vascular resistance or low flow rates. Uh, low SVR can be the result of vasodilators, anesthetic drugs, anaphylactic shock, transfusion reactions or the patient is septic. In a very extreme rare circumstances, Addisonian crisis could be a cause of low SVR. Low flow rate could be related to technical malfunction of the cardiopulmonary bypass, excessive venting or cardiotomy suction, cannular occlusion or kinking, or it could be uh, aortic dissections. <clears throat> High mean arterial pressure during bypass could be related to inadequate depth of anesthesia, analgesia, muscle relaxation, pre-existing uncontrolled hypertension, exogenous catecholamine vasopressor administration, excessive pump flow, excessive catecholamine release in patients with pheochromocytoma or thyroid toxic crisis, malignant hyperthermia in rare, rare circumstances. Monitoring tissue, tissue perfusion during cardiopulmonary bypass is usually done by frequent arterial blood gases for looking for metabolic acidosis. Urinary output is also a marker of tissue perfusion. Mixed venous oxygen saturation measured during uh, in the venous circuit is also an indicator of global wellness during cardiopulmonary bypass. <clears throat> Myocardial protection is usually achieved by topical and central hypothermia. Cardioplegia is also administered to protect the heart um, during uh, aortic cross clamping. Uh, decompression of the heart is important in avoiding left ventricular or right ventricular distension which can compromise coronary perfusion um, during bypass. Control of non-coronary or bronchial collateral flow is also important in avoiding rewarming of the heart. Uh, potassium rich solutions produce electromechanical diastolic arrest decreasing oxygen consumption. Calcium, magnesium, adenosine, bicarbonate, insulin glutamate and lidocaine are other components of cardioplegia. 
Um, you can give either cold cardioplegia or warm cardioplegia. The cold cardioplegia is administered at 4 degrees Celsius. It's traditional, given every 30 minutes through the route of either anti-grade or retrograde. Warm cardioplegia is 37 or 29 degrees Celsius. It requires continuous infusion, unlike uh, cold cardioplegia, which is given intermittently. Uh, the advantage of warm cardioplegia is it restores energy quickly than cold cardioplegia. Um, there are two types of cardioplegia. It's a blood cardioplegia and crystalloid cardioplegia. Blood cardioplegia is commonly used. It provides improved buffering capacity, free radical scavenging, improved oxygen carriage, and superior myocardial protection in patients with low ejection fraction and long bypass times. Anti-grade cardioplegia provides best cardi cardiac protection during bypass. Anti-grade cardioplegia is administered through the aortic route after cross clamping. It is not protective in patients with severe coronary artery disease or redo surgery with occluded grafts, where the um, cardioplegic solution will not reach the myocardial tissue. Repeated administration of anti-grade cardioplegia not possible during complex aortic valve procedures. Uh, retrograde cardioplegia is administered retrograde through coronary sinus and it reaches the myocardial tissue and protects the myocardium in aortic surgeries and severe coronary artery disease patients. RV protection is not as good as anti-grade cardioplegia with retrograde cardioplegia. Uh, special delivery techniques can be used in some cases. Direct coronary artery cannula um, can be used in patients with severe aortic regurgitation. Cardioplegia delivery through proximal vein graft end after distal anastomosis is done is also done during um, coronary artery bypass grafting operations. So every checklist is used after initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass to check the adequacy of arterial inflow, venous inflow and some factors which will lead to incomplete CPB. Uh, so <clears throat> first looking at the arterial inflow, the oxygenation is monitored by the color of the patient and also by the oximeter. In the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit, also cerebral oximeter. Excessive line pressure is another factor in the arterial inflow which should be looked for immediately after the initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass, which could be related to clots in the circuit. So it will be evidenced by unilateral facial edema, the position of the cannula in the, the iota in the transesophageal echocardiogram, and aortic dissection can also cause increased line pressure. How do you detect aortic dissection during bypass? It can be readily diagnosed by transesophageal echocardiogram. There will be a difference in arterial line pressures between femoral and uh, radial artery. There will be inability to arrest the heart with anti-grade cardioplegia. And there will be a difference in um, cerebral oximeter readings or decrease in saturation in cerebral oximeter, um, which will um, alert the perfusionist and surgeon and anesthesiologist to look for um, the problems in the arterial circulation. The venous inflow uh, also could have problems. The low drainage will result in low venous reservoir blood levels. There will be facial engorgement. Uh, the right atrial distension can be readily diagnosed by TEE and elevated CVP on the monitor and decreased cerebral oximeter readings are also seen. Incomplete CPB could result from decreased venous drainage, aortic insufficiency, excessive bronchial circulation, collaterals in the chest. Um, this will reveal pulsatile arterial pressure. Uh, discontinuation of ventilation and vasoactive and inotropic medications also necessary before initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass. The travel checklist for termination of cardiopulmonary bypass is also used. Uh, the T for temperature, R for the rate, um, A for uh, adequate air um, de-airing. Uh, venting should be removed uh, before coming off bypass. Ventilation should be initiated before coming off bypass. E is um, electrolytes should be checked and the level the patient table. Uh, before termination of cardiopulmonary bypass. Failure to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass could be related to decreased preload, vasoplegia, and impaired contractility, 
um, or other systemic factors like anemia, metabolic acid-based abnormalities, hypothermia, hypoxemia, and respiratory issues. Some of the surgical causes like poor revascularization, significant residual valve regurgitation, inadequate repair of surgical defect, creation of new defects can also cause failure to wean. <coughs> Impaired contractility could be the result of pre-existing poor low ejection fraction, longer clamp time with poor protection, air embolism, arrhythmias, and increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So managing impaired contractility is adequate time for coronary reperfusion before removal of, after removal of cross clamp. Uh, around 10 to 15 minutes should be paused before coming off bypass after removal of cross clamp. Start ionotropes during that time. Maintain adequate systemic mean arterial pressure. Adequate DO, de-airing during using T, TEE. Correct any dysrhythmias before attempting to wean. Obtain pacing. Correct all correctable systemic issues like anemia, hyper, hypothermia, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia. The inotropes commonly used are catecholamines, phosphor diesterase 3 inhibitors, calcium sensitizers. Uh, the catecholamines at our institute, epinephrine is the choice between 0.02 to 0.1 microgram per kilo per minute. Dopamine and dobitamin can be used at certain institutions. Phosphor diesterase 3 inhibitors, milrinone is the commonly used inotrope. 0.25 to 0.75 microgram per kilo per minute is started after bolusing 50 microgram per kilo per minute. This can cause hypotension and will need initiation of vasopressors. Calcium sensitizers like livosamandine undergoing phase 3 trials in United States approved for use in Europe but not in uh, not FDA approved in United States. Combination of inotropes can also be used in patients with very poor low left ventricular ejection fraction. Prompt initiation of mechanical circulatory support if poor ventricular function is not responsive to standard doses of inotropes. Mechanical circulatory support, uh, there are some devices can be used for temporary circulatory support and some devices can be used for long-term support. The temporary circulatory devices are intra-aortic balloon pump, impella, tandem heart, and ECMO. So the looking at A, this is the intra-aortic balloon pump. Uh, B is the impella. The device goes through the uh, arterial peripheral arteries like subclavian or femoral root through the aortic valve into the left ventricle. Uh, it takes the blood out of this uh, left ventricle and pumps it back to the aorta uh, so that distension of the left ventricle is decreased so that it gives rest to the left ventricular myocardium uh, during recovery phase. <clears throat> so the tandem heart is also works in a similar fashion, but the cannula is um, through the femoral uh, vein uh, it goes through the interatrial septal puncture into the left atrium. So it draws blood from the left atrium and puts it back in through the pump into the femoral artery. Mm -hmm. So the basic uh, principle is to decrease the distension of the left ventricle and improve the recovery of the left ventricular myocardium um, during any injury. <clears throat> The intra-aortic balloon pump works in a different way. Um, it is a mechanical device that increases myocardial perfusion while at the same time increasing cardiac output. It has been in clinical use since 1968. IABP consists of a catheter with a balloon mounted at its tip. As you see, um, this is a balloon mounted at the tip of the device. Um, the balloon is thin-walled, 2 into 20 centimeter in diameter with a 40 cc capacity when filled with either carbon dioxide or helium. Carbon dioxide has less chance of embolic phenomenon, however, helium has lower density which allows for faster inflation and deflation at precisely timed interval, hence uh, helium is preferred gas. IABP mechanism, it is positioned in the descending thoracic aorta with the tip dust just distal to left subclavian artery. Uh, TEE is used to check the position of the IABP. It is programmed to inflate during diastole and deflate 
just before LV ejection. The proper functioning of IABP depends on the precise timing of balloon inflation and deflation relative to the cardiac cycle. By deflating in the iota immediately before LV ejection, it functions to reduce the afterload, thereby decreasing left ventricular work and myocardial oxygen consumption. By inflating, it increases diastolic pressure, hence improves the perfusion through the coronary arteries. And this is uh, <coughs> the balloon waveform. As you see, this is the inflation point um, that is during um, the, at the at or below the diacrotic notch, it inflates. So the increases the diastolic pressure. This is the augmented diastolic pressure. And it before the aortic valve opens, it deflates so that the uh, assisted uh, systolic pressure is lower to improve the systemic perfusion. So if you see the assisted diastolic pressure is higher than the systolic pressure, and the assisted systolic pressure is lower than the systolic unassisted pressure. So indications, American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology and the European Society of Cardiology recommend the use of IABP in acute MI with cardiogenic shock. It's a class one recommendation. IABP is used to stabilize patients before or after interventions like angiography, thrombolysis, percutaneous coronary interventions, and coronary artery bypass surgery. IABP is also indicated in patients with hemodynamic instability due to acute ischemic mitral regurgitation, ventricular septal rupture, and intractable arrhythmias. IABP is not effective in patients with minimum residual myocardial function like cardiomyopathy, irregular cardiac rhythms, and patients with severe and critical coronary stenosis. IABP's ability to directly support RV function is also not clear. IABP is contraindicated in patients with aortic valve incompetence, aortic dissections, and severe peripheral vascular disease. IABP can produce complications. It's usually vascular complications like a leg ischemia or bleeding into the legs. Uh, thrombocytopenia is another problem. Fever, recent literature suggests lower angio ischemic complication like 18% compared to previous literature, which reported complication as high as 50%. Extracorporeal life support is another form of temporary circulatory support. The indications are inability to win from cardiopulmonary bypass after cardiac surgery despite maximal ionotropic support, postoperative cardiogenic shock after cardiac and non-cardiac surgery, craft failure after lung and heart transplantation, in-hospital cardiac arrest, acute massive pulmonary embolism, acute pulmonary edema, acute myocardial infarction, postpartum cardiomyopathy, fulminant myocarditis, procedural support in the operating room and cardiac catheterization laboratory like airway procedure, descending aortic thoracic surgery, lung transplantations. In patients with overdose, drug overdose or cold water immersion also it can be used to support circulation. Hemodynamic indications include any patient with cardiac index less than 1. Uh, 1.0 eight liters per centimeter square in conjunction with the following conditions, left atrial pressure or PCWP more than 20, systolic blood pressure less than 90, mean arterial blood pressure less than 60, urinary output less than 20 ml per hour, or presence of metabolic acidosis and systemic vascular resistance more than 2,100. So these are all some of the hemodynamic indications for ECLS. ECMO could be two types, VV ECMO or VA ECMO, so V no venous ECMO or veno arterial ECMO, peripheral versus central ECMO. So VA ECMO is used for cardiopulmonary support, VV ECMO is used only for pulmonary support like an oxygenation uh, support. <clears throat> so in VV ec VA ECMO, the blood is taken away from the femoral vein or some peripheral vein, goes to the uh, circuit, gets oxygenated, pumped back into the femoral artery, uh, oxygenated blood. Uh, in VV ECMO, blood is taken from from the femoral um, vein and taken to the circuit, oxygenated and puts back into the internal jugular vein. So that's the veno-venous bypass. It doesn't bypass the heart, so if you this requires good cardiac function.
spectrum management anticoagulation is usually two, 200 ACT is required LV distension could be a problem with peripheral ACMOS so an additional impella or balloon pump could be required to relieve LV distension uh, monitoring and weaning of ACMO should be done under trans thoracic or trans uh, esophageal echocardiography um, end organ function should be monitored ventilation should be continued to avoid atelectasis the complications of ACMO could be patient related like a, a ischemic leg or machine related like a clotting complications the it, ECMO can be used to bridge to bridge and the prognosis depends on the uh, etiology most of the uh, post cardiogenic shock uh, ECMO management has a good prognosis um, but out of hospital cardiac arrest has poor prognosis if you have a witnessed cardiac arrest during hospital and put the patient on ECMO the recovery is reasonably good <coughs> so ventricular assist device therapy is used to support ventricles by mechanical pump for severe heart failure patients stage 4 heart failure it could be left or right ventricular support it could be a short term support or a long term support uh, they can use continuous flows or pulsatile flows um, the intra or extra corporeal or paracorporeal devices are available so intracorporeal devices are implanted completely inside the body. The extracorporeal or paracorporeal, uh, they can have pumps outside the body. Um, the strategies at implantation include bridge to transplantation. You are in implanting a device uh, to have the patient listed for a heart transplantation. Bridge to recovery is expecting recovery of the myocardium uh, during the temporary uh, phase of support. Destination therapy, the patient lives with that uh, bad support for life. Extracorporeal devices, as you see, these uh, pumps um, of the right ventricular support or left ventricular support lie outside the body. Uh, so the blood is in the right ventricular support, blood is taken out of the right atrium, goes to the pump and it pumped back into the pulmonary artery. The left ventricular support, the blood is taken from the left ventricular apex and pumped back into the iota. So it gives the relative period of rest to the right and left ventricles so that it can recover. <coughs> so the continuous intracorporeal LVADs are commonly used nowadays for end stage heart failure stage 4. Um, this is a heart made 2 device which takes the blood out of the um, left ventricular apex and pumped back through this uh, axial pump into the um, iota. This is a centrifugal pump here, um, this is a heart where this is a new device which can be completely implanted into the thoracic cavity and it pumps the blood back into the iota from the left ventricular apex. <coughs> common perioperative issues with bad implantation procedure patients with compromised cardiac status preoperatively and pre bypass period coagulopathy and thromboembolism right ventricular dysfunction requiring or bad insertion could happen in 20% of patients vasoplegia cardiac arrhythmias and end organ dysfunction are also common problems in these patients uh, ischemic preconditioning uh, means the create a period of ischemia and perfusion ischemia and perfusion alternatively and precondition the myocardium and when exposed to longer period of ischemia the outcome is uh, the myocardial recovery is almost very good compared to if you have a perfusion followed by sudden ischemia which lasts for a longer period the relative infarct size is more um, without any preconditioning ischemia. So this principle is applied through pharmacological means like several pharmacological and anesthetics can induce ischemic preconditioning like effects, isoflurane, any inhalation agents, morphine, beta blockers, adenosine. Um, this can be antagonized by hyperglycemia and sulfonylureas. This is an exciting area for research. Uh, off pump coronary bypass grafting in patients with good LV function without significant comorbidity to undergoing one or two grafts or it can be done in patients with significant comorbidities who cannot tolerate cardiopulmonary bypass associated with systemic effects. Severe examples are severe renal disease, patients at risk for neurologic dysfunction and the choice of off pump versus on pump depends on institutional experience and surgeon's preference. Anesthetic considerations 
pumps preparation just like any on pump bypass the perfusion should be available uh, the circuit should be ready to go lower targets for ACT like 250 to 300 monitoring similar to on pump cabbage patients with compromised LVEF undergoing multiple grafts will benefit from PA catheter with the SVO2 capabilities because SVO2 gives a warning, persistent SVO2 less than 60% may benefit from conversion to cardiopulmonary bypass. Temperature maintenance, uh, the normothermia should be maintained in this patient. Hemodynamic instability can happen during cardiac manipulations, during graft implantation. Close communication with the surgeons is essential. Minimally invasive bypass surgeries are nowadays done. Mid caps are done for uh, LAD anastomosis through left thoracotomy. It's an off pump lima to LAD anastomosis. We use intrathecal morphine 0.3 milligram because this is a thoracotomy and painful in the post-operative period. Left lung isolation through double lumen tube or a bronchial blocker is essential. These patients can be usually extubated in the operating room like any thoracotomy. There are other procedures minimally invasive like robotic assist mid cab, um, keyhole total endoscopic cabbage surgery, hybrid cabbage and PTCA stenting during the same settings. These are all done in some of the institutions, but mid-cab is the one which is common. Um, shock states can be classified into hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, septic shock, and other forms of shock. First, we will describe hypovolemic shock. The examples include trauma, GI bleeding, rupture, AAA. Early intervention is essential for good prognosis, early blood transfusion, large bore venous access above the diaphragm. The type of IV fluids like crystalloids or colloid makes no difference in outcomes. The drugs to avoid uh, or uh, drugs which can cause hemodynamic compromise like propofol, scopolamine, etamidate, catamine, minimal inhalation anesthetic and narcotic technique is used in patients with hypovolemic shock. Massive blood transfusion protocol is used in patients with um, excessive blood loss. Uh, it is defined as more than 10 units of blood given in 24 hours. Individual hospital protocols um, are, um, should be available for use or in our institution PRBC, FFP and platelets are used in one in one and one ratio. The older protocols have one in four. For every four units of blood, one FFP. Every 10 units of blood, one platelet is used, but now it is changed. Uh, the transfusion should be guided by thromboelastography. The factors predicting massive transfusion in trauma patients include penetrating injuries, positive focused assessment with sonography for trauma. If the heart rate is more than 100 per minute or BP less than 90 millimeter mercury. Mm -hmm. The acute cardiogenic shock is usually the result of acute myocardial event or it could be a deterioration from existing myocardial dysfunction or other structural valve diseases like acute aortic stenosis or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. The monitoring uh, therapy is essential in acute cardiogenic shock, invasive continuous arterial line, pulmonary artery catheters with mixed venous oxygen capabilities and tran trans esophageal echocardiography are all um, improve outcome in patients with acute cardiogenic shock. The therapy include the uh, preload reserve assessment and optimize the preload, maintain sinus rhythm, infusion of ionotrope like uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine and milrinone to maintain pump mechanism. At maximum doses of ionotropes, evaluate and initiate mechanical circulatory support. Specific therapy include ST elevation MI, the cath lab and open up the coronary vessels by PCI or coronary artery bypass graft in the operating room. Severe aortic stenosis may require balloon valvuloplasty, hokum, and systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve and LVOT obstruction may need beta blocker, volume infusion, and phenylephrine, and uh, inotropes should be stopped to avoid tachycardia. Pulmonary embolism can be result of blood clots or air embolus, fat embolus or amniotic fluid embolus. Blood clots usually result from lower extremities in patients with deep vein thrombosis. Uh, this can be the result of hypercoagulable disorders, prolonged bed rest, immobility and oral contraceptives and cancer. A uh, sudden increase in pulmonary vascular resistance and can cause shunting, VQ mismatch, atelectasis, and ultimately hypoxemia. The symptoms and signs range from mild
mild with no symptoms to severe cardiovascular collapse. Dyspnea, chest pain, wheezing, and cyanosis are common. Tachycardia with split second sound, low SpO2s, hypotension, and elevated CVPs are some of the signs. Diagnosis is established by CT angiography, ventilation, perfusion scan, uh, thrombo uh, transesophageal echocardiography, or transthoracic echocardiography, which will show signs of RV pressure overload, RV dysfunction, actual clots and PA on right side of heart can also be diagnosed. D-dimers, negative D-dimers will exclude the presence of thrombus, positive D-dimers will need further workup. Prevention and management, uh, the prevention of formation of clots is by early ambulation, use of elastic stockings, pneumatic boots, subcutaneous heparin, low molecular weight heparin every 12 hours prophylaxis. Inferior vena cava filters can be used for high risk surgeries. Um, <clears throat> patients undergoing high risk surgeries prophylactically, IVC filters can be inserted to um, avoid uh, pulmonary embolus formation. Once pulmonary embolism has occurred, initial therapy is with low molecular weight heparin and warfarin. Uh, thrombolysis can be used, surgical embolectomy in severe patients, severe cardiovascular collapse and main pulmonary artery thrombosis. During this phase of thrombolysis or surgical embolectomy, hemodynamic and respiratory support is essential. Uh, the septic shock is um, diagnosed and managed by goal-directed therapy. Uh, the goals during goal-directed therapy include the mean arterial pressures more than 65 millimeter mercury, central venous pressure between 8 to 12 millimeter mercury, 12 to 15 in controlled ventilation patients. Urinary output should be maintained more than 0.5 ml per kilo per hour. SVO2 more than 65 percent. Hemoglobin should be 7 to 9 gram per dl and the lactate should be less than 4 millimoles per later. Perioperative considerations in this septic patients include administration of proper broad spectrum antibiotics. You should identify the source of infection, fluid resuscitations to goals, crystal, using a crystalloids and colloids in a combined fashion. In patients to resistant to fluid therapy, vasopressure should be administered for goal directed therapy. In patients with low cardiac index and low MAP, inotropic therapy can be used. Nor epinephrine is the vasopressor of choice. Vasopressin epinephrine and dopamine can be used in patients not responsive to norepinephrine. Dobutamine is the inotropic of choice. Corticosteroids are given if the goals are not achievable by above agents. Blood transfusion is given to maintain the hemoglobins between 7 and 9 gram per dl. Blood products if there is bleeding or if there is an invasive procedure if the blood products are not used to treat a laboratory evidence of coagulopathy but to actually clinical bleeding. Supportive therapy should be used for acidosis, hyperglycemia, and the lung protective ventilation with low tidal volume, high PEEP should be used. Sedation should be optimized. Renal replacement therapy should be initiated in these patients. Stress ulcer prophylaxis and nutritional support are essential elements of septic patients. Anesthesia for carotid endotrectomy is uh, carotid endotrectomy is indicated in more than 70 percent of occlusion or lesser degrees of occlusion in symptomatic patients. High risk patients with hypertension and cardiovascular diseases, um, <clears throat> these patients are very high risk because they have always have some form of peripheral vascular disease and cardiovascular diseases. The myocardial infarction is the most common cause of mortality in these patients. Stroke is the most common cause of morbidity after carotid endotrectomy. The Anesthetic management, the regional anesthesia can be given by deep or superficial cervical block. Uh, the common mode of anesthesia is general anesthesia, but the regional anesthesia offers an advantage that neurologic examination can be maintained during the procedure of an awake patient. Avoidance of intubation and hemodynamic consequences in these patients. <clears throat> Disadvantages of regional anesthesia include a non-secure airway. Uh, uncooperative patient becoming combative if neuro dysfunction arises during the procedure and complications of regional technique by itself like an intrathecal injection, phrenic nerve injury. This is the deep cervical nerve blocks. 
um, the mastoid process and the C6 uh, tubercle is palpated and uh, the line is drawn between and the posterior to posterior border of sternocleidomastoid um, uh, uh, C2, C3, C4 tubercles are palpated and uh, the needle is advanced till the tubercle is reached and withdrawn 2 cm and injected the low, local anesthetic. So that is deep cervical plexus block uh, for regional anesthesia of carotid endotectomy. General anesthesia is used in most of the patients at our institution, two large bore intravenous access, one for vasoactive active medication infusions, other for volume therapy if needed. Invasive arterial line placement is always done for these patients. Standard ASA monitoring with cerebral monitoring is used. Uh, blood should be readily available, type and screened. <clears throat> Stump pressure, if it is less than 50 millimeter mercury, will need a shunt placement for the procedure. If there is a change in electroencephalogram or somatosensory evoked potential, there will be a need for shunt insertion. Cerebral oximeter is also used in some centers for carotid and artery endotrectomies. Uh, transcranial Doppler uh, is another monitor which can monitor middle cerebral arterial blood flow during uh, carotid endotrectomies. So various combinations of the cerebral monitors are used in different institutions. Uh, hemodynamic management, avoid fluctuations in blood pressure and heart rate during intubation and induction. Keep mean arterial blood pressure above baseline 10 to 20 percent during clamping. Further elevation of blood pressure may be required if there is a neurophysiologic changes. Mean arterial pressure should be brought to baseline after release of clamp. Stimulation of carotid sinus may induce bradycardia and hypotension. Avoidance of coughing and blood pressure rise during emergence will prevent hemato hematoma formation and re need for re-exploration. Post-operative complication, there is an ipsilateral baroreceptor dysfunction leading to hypertension and hematoma formation and maybe hyperperfusion injury. There could be a neurologic compromise from this procedure. Myocardial infarction, as we told, is the common reason for mortality. The nerve injury from the procedures could be recurrent nerve laryngeal nerve injury, facial and hypoglossal uh, nerve injuries. <clears throat> Abdominal aortic aneurysm resections, uh, progressive dilatation of all layers of aorta by at least 50 percent of the expected diameter is the uh, definition for abdominal aneurysms. Uh, surgery is indicated when AAA diameter is more than 5 centimeters. Transperitoneal, retroperitoneal and laparoscopic endovascular approaches are used for, to resect the aneurysms. Anesthetic considerations, preoperative cardiac evaluation using AHA ACC recommendations, pre-procedure epidural catheter placement in patients without coagulopathy, standard monitoring ASA monitoring is used in addition. We use invasive blood pressure, large bore IV access and central venous pressure monitoring in patients with poor left ventricular function, transesophageal echocardiogram or PA catheters are used. Blood products should be available in the operating room fluid restriction and glow directed therapy have been shown to be useful in these patients renal protection by maintaining adequate mean arterial blood pressure and some institutions use mannitol um, before cross clamping in these patients <clears throat> systemic responses to aortic cross clamping when you cross clamp the aorta there will be rise in proximal blood pressure and there will be decrease in the circulation to the legs. So <clears throat> what happens during cross clamping, there is passive recoil distal to the clamp which increases preload. There will be increase in afterload, there will be increase in uh, radial arterial pressure, there will be improved coronary arterial blood flow. It depends on the coronary risk or contractile reserve. If there is a good contractile reserve, they increase the cardiac output, all these changes, but there is diminished contractile reserve, then the patient can suffer. <clears throat> So more proximal the clamp is applied, more hemodynamic changes than the more impact on the heart. So for example, if your patient have a thoracic aortic cross clamping, it will have more impact compared to I abdominal aortic cross clamping. If there is an, uh, during unclamping phase, there will be distal tissue, there will be vasodilatation and pooling of blood in the legs and leading to hypotension. There also be increased permeability and pulmonary edema. There will be increased loss of intravascular fluid leading to central hypovolemia, decreased venous rate and decreased cardiac output and hypotension. <clears throat> so 
uh, it is universal to see um, a proximal increase in blood pressure during cross clamping and a decrease in blood pressure during unclamping. So the anesthesiologist should be prepared to deal with unclamping and clamping in these surgeries. Peripheral vascular surgeries um, are also common in tertiary institutions. Patients with significant comorbidity present for peripheral vascular surgery. Uh, these surgeries can be done under open or endovascular approaches. The endovascular approaches are becoming more common, which can be done under sedation most of the time, but open procedures can be done under either regional anesthesia or general anesthesia. General anesthesia is used in patients with uh, comorbidities. Uh, regional anesthesia can also be used there is a clear controversy whether regional anesthesia is superior to general anesthesia in producing outcomes. If we look at the advantages and disadvantages, regional anesthesia can avoid hemodynamic changes associated with general anesthesia. There is improved graph patency, decreased use of narcotics, reduced respiratory and cardiovascular complication in patients receiving regional anesthetic. General anesthetic, there is a secure airway, elimination of patient tolerance in prolonged surgery related to position safe in anticoagulated patients unlike regional anesthetic. Ascending aortic or arch of aorta surgery, aneurysmal disease, uh, inflammatory infections of aortic valve, aortic root and ascending aorta and also emergent procedures like acute aortic dissections and ruptured aneurysmal di diseases. Anesthesia consideration for ascending and root surgeries, airway compression can happen during giant aneurysms. So they, that CT scan should be reviewed in all aneurysm patients before managing the airway. Arterial line should be placed proximal and distal to the clamping. Hemodynamic management but there is should be a blood pressure control during induction intubation to avoid increase in intraluminal pressure of the aneurysm and rupture of the aneurysm role of transesophageal echocardiography in aortic valve assessment before and after aortic valve surgery to rule out aortic incompetence or any paravalvular regurgitations cerebral monitoring is used during deep hypothermic circulatory arrest uh, it can be by either transcranial Doppler or cerebral oximeter or TEG or electroencephalogram or SSCPs. Coagulopathy is universal during deep hypothermic arrest and it should be monitored by thromboelastogram and managed accordingly. Deep hypothermic arrest, profound hypothermia for organ protection during no flow circulatory arrest used for surgery involving aortic arch and head vessels. It's limited to 30 minutes, higher the duration, what's the neurologic outcomes. If surgery requires hypothermic arrest more than 30 minutes, use anti-grade cerebral perfusion. Slow rewarming is important in avoiding injury to the brain. Anti-grade and retrograde perfusion methods. If the DHCA is more than 30 minutes, then um, anti-grade perfusion is used. What happens is you have a perfusion cannula in the subclavian or axillary artery, and you clamp that innominate vessel and uh, perfuse um, through the uh, subclavian artery to the uh, brain. Um, it goes through the internal carotid artery. So the clamp application is essential to prevent um, the soiling of the surgical field. Um, there will be um, <clears throat> a individual perfusion of left carotid artery can be necessary in patients with incomplete circle of villus. Um, the retrograde perfusion is perfusion through the SVC cannula into the brain in a retrograde fashion. Anti-grade perfusion has been shown to be improve outcomes in patients with prolonged uh, deep hypothermic arrest. Anesthesia for descending aortic surgery, open thoracoabdominal aneurysm repairs are complicated and anesthesia management should be done by advanced cardiothoracic anesthesiologist. It has a long thoracoabdominal incision which benefits from epidural uh, catheter placement. Cerebrospinal fluid is necessary to avoid spinal cord injuries. Right, it, the operation is done in right lateral position with the leg rotated. Airway compression from descending aneurysms is possible. Double lumen tube uh, required for left thoracotomies. This is one, page, one patient where a right sided double lumen insertion may be necessary if there is a severe compression of left bronchus. Uh, monitoring, right radial and right femoral lines are placed. 
um, because you have to monitor blood pressure above and below clamping. Um, PA catheters and transesophageal echocardiograms are used. Thromboelastogram is used for coagulopathy monitoring, routine every hourly arterial blood gas monitoring. Motor evoked potential and sensory evoked potentials are monitored to uh, avoid spinal cord injuries. Cerebrospinal fluid monitoring, drainage should be done for CSF pressure above 10 millimeter of mercury. The left heart bypass, partial cardiopulmonary bypass is done during these procedures. A cannulation is done in the left atrium and blood is taken to the um, extracorporeal circulation and put back into the femoral artery. It decreases the spinal cord and renal injuries and improves survival. It facilitates repair during aortic cross clamping and maintain distal perfusion. ACT required is 200. Hemodynamic management depends on several monitoring um, techniques like a radial blood pressure, distal femoral blood pressure, thrombo, uh, TEE and PCWP. <laughs> Actual flows, antihypertensives, inotropes, volume infusions according to hemodynamic monitors. So if you have a increased radial pressure and decreased uh, distal femoral blood pressure, increase in flow through the um, uh, left heart bypass may be necessary. If you have an increase in distal femoral blood pressure and decrease in radial blood pressure, you may decrease the flows. If you have both decreased radial and femoral blood pressure, volume infusion may be necessary. The TEE and uh, PA catheter can definitely guide these manipulations, hemodynamic manipulations. Spinal cord is supplied by an anastomotic plexus between all the vessels like posterior, intercostal arteries, lumbar vessels, sac sacral vessels, anterior and posterior spinal vessels. So there is a rich anastomotic plexus. Spinal cord protection depends on the mean arterial blood pressure and CSF pressure. Um, if there is increased CSF pressure, there will be decreased spinal cord perfusion pressure. So increase the mean arterial blood pressure and maintain the CSF pressure below 10 millimeter, 10, uh, 10 centimeter uh, CSF. Maintain 40 millimeter mercury during clamping um, the spinal cord perfusion pressure which is the key uh, for maintaining spinal cord um, perfusion and avoiding injury to the spinal cord. Endovascular aortic surgery offers improved short-term survival, especially in high-risk patients, also ruptured aneurysms. Eligibility depends on the size of the aneurysm, risk of rupture, life expectancy, and adequate proximal neck of aneurysm. Complications include rupture, access vessel injury, bleeding, medical complications, stent malpositions, renal dysfunction, and post-implantation syndrome in the immediate post-operative period. Spinal cord injury Injury possible in thoracic endovascular repairs. Local regional anesthesia can be used for endovascular repairs. The advantages include greater hemodynamic stability, less requirement of fluids, vasopressor, cyanotropes, minimal changes in pulmonary mechanics, ability to detect complications early with the awake patient, enhanced recovery profile. Disadvantages, patient discomfort in long procedures. Patients should be able to comply with breath holding and remain immobile to allow the procedure and avoid complications. Need to convert to GA if the procedure is converted to open. General anesthesia, the advantages are airway secured, allowing better management of complications like rupture if it occurs, manipulation of hemodynamics with medications, better patient tolerance, reduced patient movement during critical stages, control of respiration during fluoroscopy, placement of lines and transfusion is easier in anesthetized patients. Disadvantages of general anesthesia, more hypotensive episodes, more requirement for bisopressors and fluids, longer recovery time, more ICU requirements. Conduct of anesthesia include large obtaining large bore intravenous access, arterial line placement, right radial artery if the left subclave and artery coverage is required during deployment, controlled hypotension or rapid pacing is not required anymore with current generation graphs, low normal blood pressure is recommended, fast track anesthesia, tight rate to early recovery, uh, thoracic endovascular rep uh, repair, cerebral monitoring if the head vessels are covered or bypass of head vessels is 
is planned. Spinal cord monitoring and CSF drainage is advised if planned graft interrupts hypogastric artery, lower thoracic intercostal vessels or subclavian artery, previous concomitant triple A repair, uh, coverage exceeding 205 millimeter. These are all some of the indication for spinal cord monitoring and CSF drainage in TAVAR procedures. Um, ACLS guidelines, immediate actions after cardiac arrest, airway management, ventilation issues, support of circulation, peri-arrest management of arrhythmias, identifying reversible causes, post-resuscitation care and organ donation. Basic airway maneuvers include head tilt and chin lift, modified jaw thrust, clear secretions in the oral cavity, cricoid pressure is, pressure is no longer recommended which can impede ventilation, oropharyngeal airways can be inserted to improve ventilation, clinched teeth uh, is a, a, a problem with oropharyngeal airways. Um, in those cases, nasopharyngeal airways can be used, but the problem with nasopharyngeal airways is bleeding. Um, advanced airway management, endotracheal tube is the definitive airway. In untrained individual supraglottic airways like combi tube or laryngeal mask airway can be used. Ventilation, you can use a passive oxygen flow or positive pressure ventilation. Positive pressure ventilation is given by 10 breaths per minute at 400 to 600 ml tidal volume. It is given at high rates and Tidal, high tidal volumes can cause problems like increased aspiration in bag and mask ventilation, decreased venous return and decreased cardiac output. So the tidal volume should be optimized at 400 to 600 and it should be given at 10 breaths per minute to avoid complications. High quality compressions include the rate at 100 per minute, depth at 5 centimeter. In patients with secure airway, compression should not be stopped for ventilations which will be given every 6 to 8 seconds. In patients with bag and mask ventilation, compression and ventilation should be performed at 30 is to 2 ratio. Early defibrillation is the key, 360 joules for monophasic defibrillation, 150 joules for biphasic initial dose, escalate up to 360 joules. Every shock should be followed by one minute of good quality CPR. Uh, drug delivery can be done by peripheral large caliber veins like anticubital or external jugular. Intraosseous cannulation can be used in patients with difficult access. Central vein insertion could be done as soon as possible. And Endotracheal administration of drugs is no longer recommended because the drugs should be delivered at 10 times the normal IV dose and levels are suboptimal still. A slow circulation time should be recognized after drug injection, give 30 to 60 seconds of CPR to improve the delivery of the drugs and 10 to 20 ml saline push can be used to improve the delivery of the drugs too. Therapeutic hypothermia at 33 degrees for at least 24 hours is one of the care after return after spontaneous uh, circulation, UC, euglycemic control, prevention of hyperoxia, early PCI or other measures which can be used to improve the outcomes after spontaneous circulation returns. The common drugs used during resuscitation include epinephrine, amiodarone and lidocaine. Epinephrine is used in 1 in 10,000 concentration up to 1 milligram um, vial which can be repeated as necessary. Amiodarone is used as a 300 milligram bolus for pulseless VT or VFib followed by infusion at 1 milligram per minute over 6 hours then 0.5 milligram per minute over next 18 hours. Lidocaine is used at 1 to 1.5 milligram bolus followed by 50 microgram per kilo per minute infusion for pulseless VTAC or VFib. If you have a stable VT 10 milligram per minute followed by 50 micro gram per kilo per minute after conversion of the rhythm. Other drugs used are adenosine, uh, verapamil, diltiazem. Uh, all these drugs are used for supraventricular arrhythmias. Adenosine is used at 6 milligram IV push followed by 12 milligram if necessary. Uh, dopamine can be used for bradycardia, magnesium sulfate for tarsi D points, 1 to 2 gram over 15 minutes. Uh, drugs taken off routine use during resuscitation include atropine is not recommended for asystole but it can be used for symptomatic bradycardia at 0.6 to 2.4 milligram. Calcium chloride can be used for hyperkalemia with EKG changes. 5 to 10 ml of calcium chloride or 15 to 30 ml of calcium gluconate can be given over 22 to uh, over 2 to 5 minutes. Bicarbonate can be used for hyperkalemia, severe metabolic acidosis, tricyclic 
chronic antidepressant overdose, 1 to 1 1.5 ml per kilo of 8.4 percent sodium bicarbonate repeat after arterial blood gas analysis if necessary. The underlying cause of acidosis should be treated and the effect on this um, effect of this on acid base status should be evaluated. Reversible causes are 5H and 5T. Uh, 5H include hypoxemia, hyperkalemia, hydrogen ion acidosis, hypovolemia and hypothermia. 5Ts include tension, pneumothorax, tamponade, toxic ingestions, thrombosis, pulmonary or coronary. The ACLS algorithms should be followed in patients with pulseless arrest. The first phase of um, first initiation should be basic life support which includes call for help, give CPR, give oxygen, attach monitors and defibrillators. If there is a shockable rhythm, then continue the um, CPR but also give shocks. Um, epinephrine and uh, vasopressure can be administered if necessary and amiodarone and lidocaine and other antiarrhythmics can be administered if necessary. For example, if you have a shockable rhythm, um, and then ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC, give one shock and then continue five cycles of CPR and then recheck the rhythm. If there is a rhythm but shockable, give another shock and give a dose of vasopressors and that can be repeated every three to five minutes and continue CPR for another five cycles and recheck the rhythm. If there is a rhythm, and shockable, give another shock and consider giving antiarrhythmic like amiodarone, lidocaine or magnesium sulfate if torsade happens. If there is no shockable rhythm and there is return of electrical activity with pulse, start post resuscitation care. If there is no electrical activity or no shockable rhythm, then the proceed to asystole pathway which includes five cycles of CPR and give vasopressors like epinephrine every three to five minutes. You can give vasopressin instead of epinephrine for the first or second dose. Consider atropine for slow pulse rate. Repeat every three to five minutes up to three doses. Recheck the rhythm. If it is shockable, continue with the shock cycle if it is not shockable, then continue with the asystole cycle. If there is a return of electric activity during this any phase uh, with pulse, start post-resuscitation care. <clears throat> white complex tachycardia can be stable or unstable. Stable white complex tachycardia should be treated by IV amiodarone or IV lidocaine, um, followed by infusion of those drugs. Unstable white complex tachycardia should be treated by synchronized cardioversion um, and then followed by drugs like amiodarone and lidocaine. That is the end of this lecture. <coughs>